our God. And Lord, we sing around us this day. One thing remains is the love of God.
your bosom. So Father, I, we thank you that as we gave, you will open up the windows of heaven and you will pour us out a blessing, pour us out a blessing. And we thank you, Father, that as we go through a season of giving, we will not go weary. Pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, with thanksgiving. And let the church say, Amen. 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 Amen.
are a good God. And we pray for your people today, oh God, that as they stand and as they worship you today, oh God, some of us came, oh God, with cares and concerns, oh God. We have blessed you with our offerings, oh God. But we still, oh God, are worried and concerned about our personal lives. But we know, oh God, that you have bestowed a blessing upon us, oh God. So we pray today, oh God, that we will have peace in knowing that our God is handling the power, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for the word that you have placed in our hearts, oh God, to share today. We ask that it will go forth like a cease when it's safer. Oh God, we pray that it will be a change agent, that it will allow us to see the areas in our lives that we need to continue to work on. Trusting in you alone, our all sufficient, our never failing, our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We thank you, O oh God, that healing virtues continue to flow among your people. Those who are concerned about their health, even right now, we cover them with the blood of Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, that by your stripes you are healed. And we are healed, O oh God. And so whatever is concerning our health, we touch and agree for healing today on their behalf. And we thank you, O oh God, that a wayward soul will come into your kingdom as your word goes forth. It is in my prayer. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Living Hope Cathedral. And we are grateful for the opportunity to continue to study God's Word. We are thankful that we live in a, a community where we are free to gather together and to study and to open God's Word without fear of being, um, you know, sometimes in some areas of the world, they have to hide to have these meetings. But we have the freedom to publicly come and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we are studying about the blessed life. And the past few weeks when we addressed the, um, the issue, we were addressing it, uh, we showed you how um, God wants you to be blessed um, as he bestowed a blessing upon our father Abraham. We learned that we had the power to also be blessed if we are faithful to God. We learned that we can build wealth by uh, following God's principles. And then we learned that we can, we can give even in our time of, of lack. And today, as I continue along this series about the, the blessed life, I'll be talking about the habits of a blessed life. And this is based on the book of Psalms, chapter 1. And it's one of the common Psalms that we know in addition to Psalms 23. And so I am sure if I would ask you to, to recite it, you might be able to, um, to recite it. Um, but we will read it together. And we read it from the New King's Day Version. And it reads thus Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stand in the paths of sinners, nor sit in the seats of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And here ends God's word. Thanks be to God. And so we see, as the verse started in, um, as the chapter started in this book of Psalms, in verse one, it says that blessed is the man. And you know, God desired to bless man. As a matter of fact, when God created man in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, he started by saying, and God blessed them. So when God created us, 
The first thing he did was bless us, and then he adds, he told them to go be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And so God, when he first created man, he created him with a blessing. It was only after man sinned that we saw seeing curses being bestowed upon man. It was when Adam and Eve ate of the, um, the fruit from the tree of, of good and evil. That when the curse came upon man. So when God created us, he created us because he wanted to bless us. He wanted to, he created us in his image and he wanted to have a relationship with us. So that's the first thing that we have to remember. And so the relationship with man fell apart and God had to, um, decided to choose a certain man to bless and to allow the blessings that he wanted for all men to follow through this man. And that man was Abraham. And we saw when we first um, studied this passage of scripture back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, God said to Abraham to leave the country where he was from his people, from his father's household, and to go to the land that God was going to show him. And there he was going to make him a great nation, and he will bless him and he will make his name great. And he will be a blessing. That was the promise that God gave to Abraham. And as a descendants of Abraham, we now would have that same blessing extended to us. us. Because when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 29, it tells us that as descendants, that we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So when we accept this Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become sons of God. And then it goes on to say that for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. So when you get baptized, you take on Christ. And so now you don't have a distinction between your race. You're no longer Jew or uh, Greek. You're not slave, you're not free. You're not man, you're not female. You are just one in Christ, okay? And then continuing on to verse 29, it says that if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and his, and heir, sorry, according to the promise. So that is saying that the promise that Abraham received back in Genesis that I just read, because we who are now in Christ are his heirs, and so the promise of Abraham is now our promise. Isn't that great, church? Amen. And we, excuse me, we, the seed of Abraham, had the same promise of Abraham. And what was that promise? That he will make us into a great nation, he will bless him, and his name will be great, and you will be a blessing. Verse 2 of Genesis chapter 12, verse Genesis chapter 12. So as individuals in Christ, we now have the, the blessings that were extended to Abraham being extended to us. But it, as much as it came natural to Jesus Christ's sacrifice on Calvary's cross, there are still some habits that we would need to develop in order to live out that blessing that was promised to us. And that is what we will be studying today from the book of Psalms chapter 1. And so Psalms chapter 1 verse 1 states, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. And so we see here that in order to be blessed, we have to be careful where we walk, we have to be careful where we stand, and we have to be careful where we sit. Now this doesn't mean that you can't have a relationship and have friends that are unsafe. But you have to be careful about the counsel that you are receiving. If you are interested in having a relationship with your um, spouse, and you are having issues, and you choose to take the counsel of someone who has the most 10 times, what do you think is going to end up with your relationship? Divorce. You probably will end up divorced, right? Unless that person has had a, a revelation, a change of life, and now know to tell you what not to do. But most of the time, they would counsel you based on their bad, um, their bad um, decisions that they've made in the past, okay? So we are advised not to walk in their counsels. 
And some of us, we have received God's salvation. We have now accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But we still want to hang on with the boys because they've been our boys of time we were two. And we went to middle school with them and high school and they're my buddies and I can't get rid of them. But the question is, when you are around them, who is influencing who? With your presence with them, are they now moving forward to becoming saved? Are you finding yourself going back into the old ways that you used to have before? Because a lot of times when you're walking in that council, they're saying, boy, look at you. Every Sunday going up to church, a girl, I'm saying boy, but it could be a girl too. Instead of going and boy, trying to look at you, you just get so weak now that you call yourself a Christian, right? And then all of a sudden you want to be man, right? A woman. So you're like, I, I know I'm weak, I can do that. And then next thing you know, you're back in the old ways, right? And so God is saying to us, if you want to live a blessed life, you have to be careful with the counsel that you're receiving. You have to be careful about who you're standing with. Because when you stand with that person, you stand for, for the things of the sinners, the paths of the sinners, then you will eventually get comfortable, and next thing you know, you are sitting with them. And you know when you sit in, in back in the days of David, the people who sit with you are your friends. When you are in a friendship relationship, you bring them in your house and you sit together and you have uh, a meal or whatever with them. And so, so you are saying there that God has said, if you want to be blessed, watch where you walk. Watch who's giving you counsel. Watch where you are standing. Are you spending too much time in the paths and the ways of sinful life? And then be careful you're not sitting in the seat of the scoffers. You know, the scoffers are those who, who have everything negative to say about God and about the way that God people do things, right? They just talk about um, the fact that, that um, you know, oh, you go to church and all you're doing is they're asking you for your money. But then they invite you to come to the club and they ask you to buy their drinks. Ain't that the same thing? I think it costs much more sometimes for some of those drinks. When you see the bill on a glass of wine, you're like, what? I can buy the whole bottle with that price, right? And so, so you have to be careful with the scoffers because then they will start making you go back into the old ways of life. So God has said, if you want to be blessed, be careful where you walk, be careful where you stand, and be careful where you sit. And so even now as you're hearing this, reflect on your life. Do you see some people who are giving you counsel that you need to cut off? That you need not to be listening to the counsel anymore because you're seeing that the counsel is not leading you the right path? Or do you see that you're beginning to walk back in the way of sinners because of who you are associated with? Or you're now beginning to sit and become scornful of the things of God? Because if you are, you are not walking in the way of a blessed man. Amen? Amen. You see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, it says that we are supposed to come out from among them and be separated and to touch not those things that are unclean, and then God will receive you. So God is expecting a separation. Now you would say that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Yes, Jesus was a friend of sinners, and you should be a friend of sinners too. But what we are saying is that you cannot allow the sinners to guide you and make you sinful, but instead you should be guiding them. And so if you're not guiding them and they are guiding you into a negative way, then you need to make a change. And so, a good example of a man who this happened to was Lot in, the, in um, Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, Lot is the nephew of Abraham. And when Abraham left to follow God's instruction to go to the land that God was going to show them, Lot was taken with him. And him and Lot living together, they had great success. But there was an issue because Lot had his, his herdsmen and his sheep and his, his animals or whatever they were um, herded at that time. And Abraham had them and there was always a fight on who took, who sheep belonged to who, etc. And so for peace, the decision was made to break up the group. And Lot was given a choice to choose where he wanted to live. And Lot, Lot chose a place that looked very, um, very abundant and had great success it looked like, you know, just by the visual eyes. And that place was Sodom and Gomorrah. But Sodom and Gomorrah was a place of the worst sin that you can imagine was happening there. As a matter of fact, in Sodom and Gomorrah, when, when we picked up in Genesis chapter 19, Lot is, um, some men came into the town. Lot recognizes that they are men of God that came to talk to him. 
and Lot had to quickly, first of all, Lot was found sitting at the gate with these people. So he was having a relationship with them. He was sitting with them. He was discussing or having, um, they were influencing him in some way. So he took this man into his house. And those guys in that street were breaking down Lot's door, saying, send that man out so we can have a relationship with him. That's how bad Sodom and Gomorrah was. And this is where Lot was. And he wasn't in his house praying when these people came to the town. Lot was right there sitting at the, at the city gates with them. So he was being influenced by them. As a matter of fact, Lot was offering to them his, his, his um, daughters to, to protect the men of God that was in his household. And they were like, who make you loud? You are alien here. We don't want your daughters. We want these men. Mm -hmm. And eventually the men had to pull him into the house in order to protect him from being destroyed. And so that was the kind of area that Lot was living. And he mingled himself with these people. And at the end, we saw that Lot lost his, his son-in-laws and he even lost his wife as a result of him just mingling and spending so much time in this area of um, the sinners. And so we can see that living among sinners, um, we have to because we're in a world of sinners, but if we are not careful, we can lose our family because Lot was strong. He was able to resist, but his wife had liked to take Sodom and Gomorrah, and she was looking back because she wanted to be back there, and she turned into a pillar of salt. And so we might be able to withstand it, but our children have seen it, and they are now um, saying, well, if daddy can do it, or mommy can do it, I can do it, and next thing you know, we are losing our families. And so we have to, if you want a blessed life, we need to be careful of whose counsel we are taking. Now, it goes on to say in verse two of Psalm chapter one that be careful. Don't walk with the wicked, don't walk with the sinners, don't walk with the scoffers, and then you will be blessed. But that but then he went on to say in verse two that if you would delight in the law of the Lord and on his law meditate day and night, you will be blessed. And so if God created us to, be, to, to, to bless us, we said, then would it not make sense that we would spend time in his law, listen to his, what he's saying so that we can have a blessed life? Because he has the, the book, right, that would explain what a blessed life would look like. So we are saying here that we need to delight in the law of the Lord and in his law meditate day and night. This is also something that was said by Jeremiah, the prophet, in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Sorry, um, in Hos uh, sorry, Hosea the prophet. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I would also reject you from being priests of me. Because you have forgotten the law of, the, of God, I would also forget your children. And so God is saying to us, as he said through Hosea, is that the lack of knowledge, the lack of the things of God will lead to your destruction. And as a result of that, you will end up being rejected by God because you're not um, doing the things that you're supposed to. And so instead, as Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 16 encourages us, we need to allow God's word to be, to be found. It says, your words were found and I ate them. And your words was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O God, Lord of hosts. And so what Jeremiah is saying is that when he, when he sees God's word, he eats it up. He eats it like it's um, a cookie, you know? He just wants to, 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 to marinate, to, to take all of that God's word has to offer and to hide it in his heart. And so we see here that a blessed man, the happy man, is a man who orient, orients his life around God and his word and takes pleasure in his word and this as a result allows the purpose of God to come through to him. So the secret of a blessed life is not following, not walking, not sitting with the ungodly, but instead saturating your life with the word of God. Delighting in God's word. That is your secret. Amen. That's all. Delight. Spend time in God's word. Hide his word in our heart so that we may not sin against you. Because you see, 
as your pastors, we have a job. Our job is to share God's word with you. But we do it once or twice a week, right? What about the rest of the week? Amen. You have a part to play in getting this best life. So you can't just live on the overflow of a Sunday morning. You have to start getting into a personal, devotional time with God in order to see this blessing. Because you see here in verse uh, 2, it says that you're delighting in his word. So when you see his word, it makes you happy. When you have time, when it's time for God's word, you're like, oh, yeah, it's time for the summit. It's time for God's word. It's time for, this is my time with God. Nobody going to get involved in it. Nobody going to block it, right? That's like, a, that's what the delight is, you know? Um, so they said a delight in the Lord's instruction. And then it goes on in the latter part. It says that you're going to meditate on it day and night. Now, day and night is later on, meaning that in the morning you should be doing it and the evening you should be doing it. But also day and night could be also interpreted your seasons, right? The day is when things are going good. That is a good time. Oh, God is so good. Let me see what his word says. Oh, yeah. Blessings and favors are mine, right? And so that's easy to meditate and to follow God because things are good. But what when things are bad? What when you just lost a job? What about when you just get a, a, a summons from the doctor that you have uh, illness that probably is going to um, could, could lead to death? What then? That would be nighttime, right? That is when you feel down. We are instructed to also in that time meditate on God's word. And so it is a constant, continual thing. And as a matter of fact, if you can look at meditating like the, the cow, right? When you see a cow, he ate grass. Two hours later, he's still eating the grass, right? Because he's bringing it up and chewing what we call a cud, just over and over again. Because he has two stomachs, you know, he has to go through the two systems there. But that is what we are encouraged to do. We are encouraged to meditate on it. So it doesn't say there to read the word of God day and night. Does it? So reading is important, right? Because you've got to go into the word. But what we are all probably doing to get up, to get up in the morning, alarm goes off, and you say, okay, I have to read because the pastor said I have to read. So Psalms 1 says, better than better than better than Amen. God bless you. Amen. And you all go. Right? But that's not the instructions here for the blessed life. That is a, a part of it, but we are told to meditate. So we have, that means some more time, right? Some more intentional. So you read it. Hmm. Delight in the law. What does it mean to delight? What is the law? You know, so you ask these little questions about it. Delight, law, God. Who is God? Why God? You know, why are you telling me to delight in your Lord, in the word of Lord? So you turn it over. As you go about your day, you remember back that word that you read. You know, this morning God said that I need to delight in him. So right now, these people are getting my nerves, but I'm going to delight in the Lord of the Lord. And, and his Lord, I'm going to meditate. I'm not going to meditate on those negative reports that people are giving me, right? And so that is what he said. Over and over and over again, you are thinking on the things of God and observing them according to their, what, what is written there. You see in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, when we're doing maybe the dedications, we read this verse, right? And it says that the book of its law shall not depart out of thy mouth. And you should meditate on it how often again? Day and night. Day and night. That thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Because how do you going to know what's written in the word of God? Unless you read it, right? How are you going to observe what you don't know? So it is so so if you're gonna get a blessed life by reading by by um by delighting in the word, you have to know what the word says in order to get the delight, right? Um and so day and night observe it, and then it got another part. What does it say? For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Not just success, you know, like you're really, really good success. And so we see here that that a success, blessed, prosperous life comes from spending time in God's Word. And so, Living Hope Cathedral, we have to do better. All of us have to do better. Because I looked at your screen time report this week, 
and I saw your productivity level on your screen being two, and your entertainment social media level being seven. Who's guilty? You know what I'm talking about? No, on these new phones, you know, you get a report every, every week on how much time you spend doing different things. And if we are honest, we are spending more time watching television, on our social media, playing the video games kids, Snapchatting, what else y'all do? <laughs> Instagram, uh, FaceTime, Facebook, you know? You're doing all of that. Hanging out doing absolutely nothing. Because we do that too. And there's a time for that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But we are doing all that at the expense of not reading God's word. And then we are wondering, why is it that we are not happy? Why is it that we are not successful? Why is it that we don't feel like our life is being blessed? And it's because we are being influenced by everything else except from God who is the one who created us and wants to bless us. And so, look into yourself, because I made a generalization, that might not be you, and I'm not here to, to, to cast any um, shame or blame, but I'm asking us, we desire to have a blessed life. What are we doing to make certain that we are getting it? Are we dwelling on God's word, or are we dwelling on our worries? Because we are good for that saying over and over again that we don't know how this is going to work out, that, you know, rather than saying... Memorizing the Bible, saying it over and over again, recalling the scriptures that deal with that circumstance. Whatever it is, God's word deals with it. Find the scripture that deals with it. State that instead of what the circumstance is saying. And as a result of it, we will be able... We're supposed to try to take every opportunity we have to be in his presence and be in his word. And, you know, as a, as a church, we spend a lot of money, a lot of time bringing um, talents to us as a church. And guess what? Y'all don't come. The people who are taking the free opportunities are other people. And the one that we are really invested in is for you. It is for you to know how to spend time in God's word, worshiping God, spending time in his presence, basking in his presence. And you allow the free events to be given to others, which we want them there too. But we also want you to participate in the things that God is leading in the direction that God is leading your church. On, because of the storm, we don't have our weekly prayer meetings. We do have the prayer call and the prayer line um, that you can call in too. But every second Sunday of the month at 6.30 p.m., we have an hour of power, which is one hour of prayer meeting. Why are you not going to prayer meeting? This is mother talking to y'all. I call my children in college, they're like, did y'all go to church this week? Why not? Right? So the same thing. Because it's there, this is how, how are you gonna get better if you don't spend time in the things of God? So it's not to make you feel guilty, although I want you to. But, <laughs> but it's more for you to reflect and start to do it better because this is how you will be blessed. So it's not about us, unless we are doing it too. But it's about your blessing and about your future. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I say that in love, and so I hope it's not offensive to, um, to anyone, but you have to take time out to spend as much opportunity as you have to spend time in God's word and studying God's word. And just um, so I can put um, an announcement one time while I'm at it, is that um, we've been announcing about these intensives, which are um, like a weekend of just intense time in God's word to do the Bible studies because, you know, again, because of displacement, we don't have our weekly um, Bible studies as yet. So on June 12th to the 15th, 
Um, we have a professor, a former professor from Oral Roberts University. His name is Dr. McDonald, and um, he will be um, coming and sharing with the churches. Um, Living Hope is bringing him, so it is um, it's something that we are sponsoring. We are having at this Assemblies of God um, because thankfully that sister church allows us to use their facilities, and that is um, a weekend event. It's um, it's Bible, it is studying God's word intensive. So you are almost in Bible school for four days straight. That's that's how intense it is. Okay, um, you get you, you're there. You have 50 minutes to take a break. You know this is what your classes are, and at the end of it, um, you will be able to receive uh, graduation and you receive a certificate um, from the training. The, the gentleman, as I said, is uh, a former dean of the Oral Roberts University. Um, his name is Dr. McDonald. He's also the professor of Old Testament and Jewish studies. And what he will be teaching us at this trip is the theology of the Old Testament. Because a lot of times, we don't understand what the Old Testament has to do with the New Testament. And so he's going to spend that weekend training us. Now, of course, those who are in ministry at the church is expected to be there. But you are also expected to be there, right? Because this is your time to get more information about God's Word and to meditate on it. So make some, commit, some time to commit to this. Um, like I said, it's June 10, 12 to 15. The weeknights are from 6 to 9, and the weekend, the Saturday is at 8.30 to 3 o'clock. And then the graduation will be Sunday at 6.30 p.m., all at the Assemblies of God. So continuing on, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And so that is the first thing we're going to do for the blessed life. We're going to spend time in God's word, reading, first of all, not walking with the, the counsel of the wicked, not standing in the way of sinners, not sitting in the seat of the scornful, but delighting in God's word and meditating on it day and night. So that is our first secret to the blessed life. Is that clear? All right. So now, what is the benefit of doing this? Why do all this? Well, the first thing we see in verse 3 of Psalm chapter 1 is that we will be like trees planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does prospers. The wicked are not like, not like this, but are like shafts that the wind drives away. Okay. So, the first thing we see is that if we spend time in God's word, meditating on it day and night, we will be blessed and we will become trees. Now, we're not, we didn't say we become little shrubs. We didn't say we become little grass. We become trees. So in the, the triology of the, you know, like the, the different levels of trees, you're a big tree. You're the man, you know, you've come, you have, you've been established. You're not just a little seedling, you're now a tree. Not only a tree, but you're a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. You are grounded, you are rooted, which means that when things come against, come, up, come upon you, you're not one who's gonna bow with it. It's not gonna make you fall, it's not gonna break you. It might cause you to buckle a little, but you're not gonna go down because you are planted. And not only are you planted, but where are you planted? You are planted by rivers of water, which means that you have a constant flow of the river, right? And so if you, you know, um, at our um, uh, prior home, we had a stream that was running through the yard that, um, as a matter of fact, we call the place Carabola Springs as a result of this, tr this stream of water that just flows out of the place for nothing. And so as a result, and you're having avocado trees and all sorts of things growing because the water, the source that it needs is flowing through it. And so it's the same thing. It's saying that, that when you are planted in God's word, you become a tree, you are able to grow, you become rooted, and then you have the word of God constantly flowing over your life. And so it is as it flows, you continue to grow because that's what happens when you have a good watering system on the, um, you know, flowing around you. And not only... It says um, that you will be you be rooted, and not only will it be rooted next to streams of water, but it also said that you will be 
productive. You will bring forth fruit in its season. Now, the first thing you have to realize is that it says that the productivity is going to come in season. So there will be time that you won't be as productive or as fruitful as other times. And so there are times where things are not as good, and then there are other times when things are good. But the point about it is that you are not going to be that fig tree that God curses when he passes by because there's no fruit on it. Because you are flowing and and um, planted and being infused by God's presence and God's word. Amen? In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 and 8, it says, Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Blessed again. By right? trusting in God and having hope in God. And in verse 8 it says, For he shall be like a tree. Same verse, right? Planted by the rivers of water. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 8. That, bring, that spreads out his root by the rivers and shall not see when heat cometh. So the heat is coming. You know, we had a dry season a few months straight. And we saw the area looking just dry, right? This is saying that because you are next to the water, that particular tree looks so green compared to all the others. So yes, we all are having a hardship on the dry season, but somehow you're looking fresh. Amen? And that's what God is promising you, that you're just going to be like, how come you're getting younger every time? I get it all the time. Like, how old are you? I'm like, girl, I can't tell you, but five more is coming on soon, right? <laughs> and so I got to, and they're like, what's the secret? I'm like, okay, I know it now. I'm planted by the rivers of God's word. Amen? <laughs> and so it says that, you, um, that even when dry season comes, the leaves are green. So you're not withering. You're not drying up. You're not falling up down, you know, because you are planting. And not only that, and shall not be careful in years of drought. In other words, they don't have to worry, even though it's drought season, because guess what? You got a secret source of water running next to you, right? So I'm still in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse um, 8. And it says, neither shall cease from yielding fruits. So in other words, even though there's seeing how this is going to come, you're not withering, you're not, you're not drying up, and you're still productive. You're still yielding fruits. Amen? Amen? And so that happens according to Psalms 2 verse 13, when you are planted in the house of the Lord, you shall flourish in the courts of our God. And in verse 14 of, of Psalms chapter 92, it says, and you shall bring forth fruit in old age. So you see, Alti, she can still have fruit. <laughs> and it's her children, I say fruit. <laughs> um, they shall be fat and flourishing. So you see that being planted next to God, in God's word, studying God's word, getting advice from God, the people, we will see a life that is fruitful and flourishing. Now we also have to remember that in order to flourish and to be productive, you have to plant, right? Because there's nothing planted, nothing to reap. And so we have to remember that even in our times of, of, of drought, that we have to continually uh, plant um, and, and, um, and plant our seeds and remain faithful to God, and then God will be able to, to reap, not just financially, but in every area of our life, just being faithful to God. And then, um, so we are promised a successful life, and we are also um, promised that we will be fruitful. Now, what is the purpose of fruit? When a tree bears fruit, is it for the tree to eat the fruit? No, no right? Who eats the fruit? Yeah. You and somebody else, right? So the, the purpose of being fruitful is to be a blessing to others, right? So you're going to be blessed, and then you will be flourishing, and you'll be fruitful so that others will be blessed as a result of your blessing. So it's not only a self-centered blessing that you'll receive, but you're also reproductive so that others can be, can be blessed. So the blessed life is like a tree, like I said, the leaf doesn't wither, it doesn't dry up. Even in difficult times, you remain strong, you remain tall, you remain resilient. In other words, you remain permanently, ble permanently sorry, blessed because of the steps you've taken. 
Um, and then, as I said, you will flourish, you will prosper. And so, you know, this is an example of, you know, this is, people are getting laid off and you're not being touched. You know, so like, you know how we say fair and fair? So a drought is occurring and you just somehow you've been, over, um, you've been overlooked for the bad things. Or the opposite is happening. You know, um, they're telling you they don't have the money, but they offer you a raise. You know, those sort of things will happen. So it's like, like, like even though things are bad, you're just seeing where God is working things out on your behalf. And that is what will come because you are planted and walking in the right path. Okay? So now as I close, there is a, a contrast. Because he's saying that if you do these things, this is the sort of life that you would expect it to have. But in closing, turn into verse 4 of Psalm chapter 1. It is saying that the ungodly are not so. We do not see this same blessing falling upon those who are not following God, who are not spending time in God's word, who are not, uh, who are, uh, not seeking the counsel from God. Their life are not going to be blessed. Their life are not successful. Instead, they're like shafts which the wind drives away. Now, if you think about a shaft, that is the little husk part of the fruit of the um, of the seed. So if you have wheat, you know you will uh, or corn. Because those of us in Angola, we used to live with corn and peas, right? You will shell it and then you would shake it up in this thing, and then the, the part that is the shaft will blow away, and then you will be left behind the good part, right? So um, so in the same thing, it's saying that this this thing used to be part of a, a productive um, tree. It had a purpose, but now that part you don't need it anymore, and it'll be blown away easily by the change of circumstances and by the winds of life. And also, it, will, it, it says in verse five that they would not be able to stand in judgment. Which means that when the time comes, that they come before God, they won't get a pass that says, welcome in thy good and faithful servant. Because they will not be able to stand amongst the congregation of the righteous. They would have a sentence of separation from eternity because they are not following and, and panting after the things of God. The great multitude of people that God is gathering from every tribe, tongue, and nation to have an eternity with him, they will not be part of that because they are not seeking and studying God's word. And so in verse 6 it says that the Lord knows the ways of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. And so church we have two directions that we can take with two destinations and two destinies. Those who know Christ as their Savior, walk in his path, walk in his counsel, study his word, they're able to enjoy in this life and in the future a time, a relationship, fruitfulness, productivity, and everlasting peace with God. And those who choose to continue to hang with sinners, who continue to reject the things of God, who continue to walk and not care about what God says, they will not be able to stand at the end of judgment and be welcomed into God's presence, but instead they will be sent to an unproductive life of, of pain and torture in hell. And so we then, desiring to be blessed as men, need to accept the fact that we on our own are just on a fast track to hell. And in order to get a change, we have to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so church, happiness is a choice. A blessed life is a choice. And you can choose today whom you will serve, God or man. And it's my hope and prayer that you will choose to serve God. Because you see, 
we on our own will never be perfect. On our own, we will never live a sinless life. And so God, knowing that it is not, that in order to enter kingdom of heaven, you need to have perfection. And on our own, we couldn't. And so he sent his perfect son, the lamb without spot or blemish, to die for our sins. Jesus Christ knew the law of God. He delighted in God's law. When we saw him on earth, he took time every day to go away and pray to God. And, and, um, and he was God, so he knew the word. He lived a perfect life. He didn't fail in any area of his life. And then he died. The death that the wicked should die so that he would pay the penalty for my sins and for yours. And now because of that, all we have to do is to accept his death for our, and his price that he paid for our sins. Ask him to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and then live the rest of our life serving him. And when we do that, we will be blessed. And so, I pray today that if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that even now, by the showing of your hands, you can ask for him to come into your heart and he will be able to save you. And so if you would like for me to pray for you where you are, all I need for you to do is to raise your hand so that I will know that you want God to, um, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I will pray for you and then after the service we will meet with you. So if you can just raise your hand high so I can see that your hand is raised and then I will pray for you. So Heavenly Father and God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is a life unto our path, O God. And we thank you, O God, that you are a God who loves, you are a God who sees, and you are a God who cares, O God. And we know, O God, that your desire for us as your people is that we, for us to be blessed. And we have seen today in your word, O God, that there are certain principles that you desire for us to do in order to live this blessed life. And the first of God is that we need to have a relationship with you so that the blessings of Abraham will now become ours because we are now covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so for those today, oh God, who have raised their hands, oh God, desiring to have that relationship, I pray for them today. And as we all repeat, they have their Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the, the fact that he lived a sinless life. And he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins and to purchase a place for me in heaven. In faith today, I accept what Jesus Christ has done. And I ask you to come and dwell in my heart. And it's my desire, oh God, to serve you and to bless you. And if you have said that prayer today in faith, believing that Jesus Christ has done this, you are saved. And now that you are saved, I would encourage you to have a relationship with God by spending time in His Word. So God, we pray today, O oh God, that you would help us all to be intentional, O oh God. To be intentional about the things of you. To be intentional in seeking your face. Intentional in seeking your presence. Intentional in studying your word. Help us, oh God, that just as we schedule our time for our personal lives, that we will schedule in a block of time, day and night, that we are spending in your presence, meditating on your word, remembering the things of God, and setting our desire to follow the counsel of you and not the things of the ungodly. God, I ask you, O oh God, to help us, O oh God, even now, to think about those individuals that we are allowing to, to guide us, that are just guiding us wrong, that they are scornful, they are sinners, <coughs> they are ungodly. Help us, O oh God, to learn to, to be bold enough to cut them off so that they won't have that negative influence as they're having. 
but instead, oh God, to continue to pray for them and to continue to encourage them to enter into your kingdom. God, I pray, oh God, that as your people will just continue, as we continue to study your word, as we continue to allow the fruits of your spirit to be manifested in our lives, as we continue to allow the streams of living water to flow among us, may our lives continue to prosper, oh God, as you have promised, oh God. May we be fruitful in season, out of season, oh God. And may we always remember that you have blessed us indeed, and you have enlarged in our territories so that we can be a blessing to others. God, we pray, oh God, that you will just continue to overflow abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. Bless us upon your people, oh God, as your word has promised them to have a blessed life because they are, they are passing hard after you. We pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen, amen and amen and amen. Praise God. So we thank God for how he has brought us through his word. We thank him for the word that has um, gone forth. And as we are about to um, to close, um, I just was going to open up the altar in case anyone has any personal prayer requests that they came to church with today, that the intercessors will be available and you can come forward and they will pray for you so you don't go home with that burden. And so we'll just take a, um, the next few minutes to do that as the intercessors come to the front, and if anyone has a prayer um, request that they need, we will pray for you, um, and then after which we will be um, dismissed.